So excited to talk today also about how data band is helping Airflowers meet their data SLAs and some ways that we're thinking about data SLAs generally at, at data band. Shameless plug, if you like what you see today, if you'd like to learn more about how we're helping data engineering organizations, please contact us. Uh, you can schedule a demo or a free trial for visiting our website, www.databand.ai, or contact us directly at contact at databand.com. Starting off with who we are. So uh, I'm Josh, I'm CEO and one of the co-founders of Databand. Um, we started Databand, myself and my co-founders, really to help data teams, like our previous data teams that we used to work in, achieve reliability and more consistency in the data products that teams are creating. Um, in my previous life, I was working with data organizations and saw how critical data was becoming to businesses. And it uh, was clear that it was getting to the point that the data that was being output from the engineering organization started to be um, thought of in a really similar way as like software outputs that would go into an application. And the gap between standards and reliability became a big problem for my company previously and all the different businesses that, that I've been um, working with in my previous lives. And we created DataBand in order to really help address that gap and give engineers the tools that they need to help imbue their companies with these standards and produce more reliable, trusted data outputs. Um, before DataBand, I was a product manager at an analytics company called SciSense, and before that was an analyst at an investment firm called Bessemer Venture Partners. Uh, I'll hand it over to our advisor, uh, Vinu Ganesh, to tell you a bit about his background as well. Thanks, Josh. Again, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vinu. I'm an advisor at DataBand, as Josh just mentioned. Currently, I'm CTO at Veriset, which is a data as a service company focused on delivering huge amounts of geospatial and geolocation data. Uh, my previous life, I was a compute lead, uh, the compute lead at Palantir, really focused on how to take huge amounts of data in, cleanse it, process it through all of our systems, and actually egress it or, or give it out. Uh, DataBand has been such a pivotal product for us, um, especially given that Veriset sits on both the data consumption side, when we get data from our providers, as well as the data production side as we produce data that then goes downstream of us. Really excited to be here with Josh to discuss all things data band, all things data quality. Awesome. Okay, so to frame this conversation about data SLAs, Manu and I were thinking about what's the right place to start. And what we wanted to start with was coming up with a method of thinking about all the things that are really important for data teams that uh, lead to the SLAs you might want to set, really based on first principles. Um, and Banu, I would love to hear you speak through this hierarchy that we built for data needs and how uh, we see that mapping to the, uh, the SLA concepts that we'll be talking about in a minute. Absolutely. So for those who aren't familiar, this is largely based off of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where elements in the pyramid that are higher up are dependent on elements below them. Uh, so the base and fundamental aspect of the pyramids need to be met, or the pyramid needs to be met before the higher level components are met. So looking through the lens of data, um, there's a couple of aspects of data that are just incredibly pivotal to actually making sure data is impactful. Uh, but to begin this conversation, we need to start at the primitives. The primitives is the foundation and base layer. So in a discrete snapshot of time with an individual data segment, are the essentials there? Did the data arrive? Is it in the correct format? Does it have the correct columns? Am, is my system able to just open it up? Is it not corrupt? Only when you have these primitives and this foundation can you actually begin to unlock the data asset. And again, primitives here is discrete moment of time. Data sets no longer are discrete, they evolve. As such, the next component is really reliability. Is our data dependable? When I get a stream of data or as it evolves over time, is it evolving in a predictable or consistent, both predictable and consistent way. Only then can I actually trust the data set itself and the data stream itself. Reliable data is incredibly pertinent, and incredibly important to the successful outcome component, which we'll talk about at the top level, uh, which is data impact. Are my outcomes from a business perspective actually achieved? Is this data creating desired improvement for the business? 
What this really means is if I'm looking at batch data or streaming data, those have very different impacts and very different outcomes. Uh, so if I'm expecting to have data at the fast cadence and I get one batch computation per day, sure, the primitives are there and the reliability is there, but my outcomes aren't actually being achieved. So this pyramid kind of governs what we see as the current state and the future state of the data evaluation process. And it'll inform a lot of what we speak through in the coming slides and the coming demo. Thanks, Manu. OK, so that leads to what an actual SLA is. What are we really talking about here when we say SLA? So by uh, the dictionary term, SLA, it's a service level agreement. This is an agreement that defines the standards for an engineering team and lays out how quality of product is measured, how issues are gonna be triaged, and how problems are gonna be resolved. The data SLA is, of course, just the data spin on this. And what we really believe in, in DataBand as well is that just like in uh, software engineering, how you need tools that are specialized to software applications to meet the SLAs that you set for your teams, for data teams, the same principle applies. There's nuances in how data organizations operate, that changes what a data SLA means compared to a software SLA, and you need different tools to ensure that those SLAs are being met. In uh, human terms, the data SLA essentially provides a framework for measurement to make sure that the hierarchy of needs is met that the new discussed in the last slide. So your primitives are good, your reliability is achieved, and the impact on the business is being seen. When we talk about these SLAs, and for most organizations, we're not necessarily talking about literal contracts that we see analysts and data engineers signing with each other, or even potentially that we see organizations signing with end customers that are using data. But it is important to have these um, uh, philosophical contracts in place in order to ensure that metrics are being measured and you're improving the way that you work with your consumers. Without these kinds of agreements, without these kinds of standards, it's really hard to guarantee quality. Data consumers, usually we see, are the ones who end up being the ones reporting issues because there isn't that sort of measurement process in place in the data engineering organization. So it's often the analysts that are raising hands and saying, hey, this data looks kind of weird. Is there something going on? The, the big problem there is when your consumers are the ones who are reporting issues and flagging problems, it erodes trust in the output that an engineering team is producing. This is true for data teams, this is true for software teams. So another way of looking at what the SLA does is it helps create confidence, it helps create trust in the outputs that you're producing. Um, Benu, we'd love to hear if you have any uh, stories about how an SLA saved your your uh, your teams in the past, or uh, the lack of an SLA maybe hurt things for you. Absolutely. Um, so I think just to differentiate uh, the two kinds of SLAs that Josh briefly mentioned, most organizations have contractual SLAs in place, which is you will deliver data at this cadence. That's generally the limit of those SLAs. The evolution of this SLA process is really this outcome SLA. Like, am I able to achieve the outcomes I need to with these SLAs? Now, Verisat, my current company, is in a unique situation, where, as I mentioned, we're both producers of data, in that we're data as a service company, as well as consumers of data. Uh, as such, we have data providers that frequently drop data for us that we are responsible for then aggregating and sending off. We had an issue, a uh, situation where one of our data providers uh, created a huge amount of skew in their data uh, deliveries, which went fairly unnoticed for us, largely because the primitives and the contractual SLAs were being met. Data was being delivered. So despite the fact that there was serious skew, our pipeline handled it and output files. However, given this skew, we had a massive variance of the actual file sizes that were written out. We had anywhere from 10 gigs to 10 megs. And this caused an oom on arrival for a lot of our customers, meaning their pipelines weren't configured to open such large files, and so they couldn't open it. And that process caused a huge amount of trust erosion on Veriset. Luckily, our engineers were uh, able to action it quickly and resolve it within the hour. But that always can't be said for every single situation that comes up, as was the case with our provider. Given the huge amount of skew and the poor delivery, we actually ended our relationship with that provider. 
So there are real dollars and cents that are actually backing the, these notions of SLAs. And the simple contractual was data delivered is no longer enough and no longer sufficient. Thanks. Great example of how these kinds of uh, philosophical or academic concepts will actually drill down to dollars and cents to the business. And uh, we, of course, on the engineering side, we want to make sure that we're creating as much positive outcome as possible. Having good SLAs in place helps to protect against uh, those kinds of issues. So moving forward, um, how does this relate to DataBand? Uh, well, what DataBand provides is a framework that can help you build the regime for creating these SLAs, a, a measurement framework. That's why we see DataBand as the missing piece to achieving the SLAs that your organization sets for itself. Uh, what DataBand is, is a pipeline observability platform. We monitor pipelines, we alert on job execution issues, on data quality problems, and provide engineering teams really what you need in order to triage issues and do fast remediation. With that, I'll, I'll switch over to the application itself so we can see some examples of how this works in, in real life. So what I'm starting with in the application, uh, here's DataBand, starting actually in our alerts page. So this is like the main notification stream that you're gonna get from our product related to issues that exist within your pipeline infrastructure across all pipelines and data sets that you have running in your core data engineering stack. What I'm going to do first is I'm going to filter to a time range at the end of June. The reason that I'm doing this is because uh, this is an environment where we're running real pipelines, real processes to demo our product. And there was actually some interesting events that occurred to us while working with our data provider at the end of June, which I want to use to, to showcase some of the functionality of the product. So you'll see me going into that time range here across a few different screens. So I, I just filtered our alerts to this time window at the end of June. And you can see here, there's a pipeline that's triggering a lot of notifications for us. It's called Market Data Replicate Analyze. This is a DAG being run in Airflow. There's different kinds of notifications that we're getting here. Some of these are data quality uh, issues that have come up, like the number of rows that are getting replicated in this uh, data process. It's a replication as part of the steps that it does. We also have a bunch of failures here. And what this shows at a top level is just how DataBand uh, can provide a really solid alerting framework on top of tools like Airflow with a quick integration that help you tie this to your ops infrastructure. So most teams are gonna send the alerts here into two tools like Slack, PagerDuty, OpsGenie, VictorOps that really bind your data pipelines into your normal ops workflow. What we also have in the environment is examples of performance-based alerts like this duration anomaly that came up. And this is an important kind of alert because uh, of two reasons. First of all, it tells us when a pipeline is running late, which means that data might not be delivered on time and therefore we might breach some SLA agreement that we have. Um, it also is an interesting alert showcasing the kind of anomaly detection that DataBand does behind the scenes to trigger these notifications. So in this case, we have a, a metric, the pipeline duration, we're monitoring what the normal baseline is, and we're gonna trigger an event here if we see that things are deviating high from what's typical for this process. Um, what's also I'll point out is a lot of the alerts here are not just coming from this pipeline, Replicate Analyze, but also from a second pipeline called Market Data Ingest and Transform. And I, I wanna drill into that as a, an example of some of the, the functionality that we have for meeting your SLAs. Next up, I'm going to do in the application, I'm going to analyze this pipeline a little deeper. So I'm going to jump into our dashboard. I want to go back to that same time period that we were looking at on our alerting uh, panel at the end of June. And I want to filter down into that particular pipeline that um, I want to take a deeper look at, that market data ingestion process. So first thing that DataBand is going to tell me here is, like, what's the overall health state of this DAG? Right? The basic, basic primitives here. Is this DAG finishing? Is data getting produced? Is it being delivered? That's what we want to see here in our, our top level analytics. So what these graphs are telling me is general health information. Red obviously being not so good. What I can see is that this pipeline is failing a lot of the time, the vast majority of time that it is actually executing. It looks like about 75% of its runs are going into failures. I can see that from my, my stats here. What I can also see through DataBand is the top errors area. And this is a really important uh, piece of functionality when it comes to triage of issues. What this is gonna help me do is when I'm facing this big overload of failures, which is gonna be a normal state for a lot of these pipelines that I'm running, what are the top issues that are bringing down most of these runs at uh, 
in any particular example. So what are the, what are the common error types? The way that this works behind the scenes is DataBand is collecting up logging information, we're parsing through that, and we're aggregating up the, the most uh, common issues that we see uh, behind the scenes. So I have a couple issues here that are, are grabbing my attention. One is this key error, and another one is this value error that seem to be happening quite a bit in my recent executions. What I want to focus on first is my key error. I'm going to jump into that, and we'll see if we can do a little bit of a deeper dive into why this pipeline is uh, misbehaving so much. So let's jump into when this error was last seen. And when I click in, I can see right off the bat what's the log message that contains the error. And this is going to come from any level of the stack if you're running these DAGs from Airflow. So this might come from like a Python task. It might come from a Spark job. It might come from a query that's being run in a database. DataVance can help collect up those errors. What I can see, I'll zoom in a little bit. What I can see is that the error is coming from this key error that this full-time employee's item is not in index. So it looks to me like that full-time employee's item is in the data set that this pipeline is trying to work with. Now, what I can also do is just check out what this pipeline looks like. So we're right now, again, in a specific run of our DAG. This is what the DAG looks like from the Airflow side. I can see it's failing on the sec second step, which is my transformation step. So it successfully ingested the data, whatever that task is running. But what I want to do here as a next step, I want to understand why this process is failing and see what else might be impacted by it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into my affected data sets. And what my affected data set screen is telling me, first off, is just going back to our basic SLAs, our basic primitives, how much data is this pipeline passing through, or is this data is this pipeline interacting with each time that it runs? So the first graph that I have here, even before I'm really jumping into that key error issue, just helping me understand over the different executions of this pipeline, which is what's on my x-axis, how much data is coming through the pipeline, is being read by the pipeline, and is being written. What's the input and output? What I would expect to see in a graph like this in DataBand is a pretty steady rate of data coming through. Maybe there'll be slight fluctuations here, but I, I shouldn't see really any meaningful, meaningful jumps. So right off the bat, I can see these, um, these uh, zero lines for amount of data coming through earlier on in executions and over here. These are problematic states. What's also interesting for me is um, in this current run of the pipeline, which is highlighted here, uh, it looks like the data actually did come through. So there was a lot of data that was read, and it looks like about the normal amount of data that's being written was written by this pipeline. So that can actually help me triage this issue further, because at least at a baseline, I know despite this failure, data did come through, and data is being written into the location that it needs to go to. And this can inform the severity of the alert on this process that DataBand is delivering. Next step, what I want to do is, is uh, go deeper into that key error issue that we saw. So I'm going to go down into the actual data sets themselves that this pipeline is inputting and outputting. Um, the first one here, uh, jumping into this data set, it's a data set called Fundamentals Company Overview. This is a data set that lives on S3. And what I want to do here is, is try to dig in and see if I can catch what's really causing that, that key error to come up. Why is that coming up so consistently in runs of this pipeline? So what I can do next is, is actually just jump into the schema of the data set. DataBand is going to be watching these data sets. Essentially, what we're in now is like the data set side view of the system as opposed to the pipeline side view. So what I'm seeing here is all the operations that are occurring against this location in S3. So um, I want to see the most recent schema of the last time that you know, a pipeline worked with this data set. And what's interesting here is I can see, first of all, just what the structure of this looks like. It's you know, not too big of a data set, 30 records of 59 columns. Now, I know that my, my pipeline was looking for this full-time employees column. So what I can just do is search to see if that exists in the data set. And confirming you know, it doesn't exist in the data, it's not being, um, being uh, pulled into that pipeline properly. What I want to do next is see if I can isolate the element of change. So like, when, if ever, did that uh, item exist when I originally built this process? So what I'll do is I'll, I'll sort of time travel here to earlier operations on this data set and see if I can see some element of change. So I'm just going to go back to some point in history. So over here, we're now in the beginning or, or middle of June. 
I started closer to the end of June. Let's see if we can see what that schema looks like. Okay, so here, right off the bat, I can see at this earlier state of the data, we actually had 60 columns in the data set. And a second ago, I showed you we had 59. So I want to see if I can isolate that even further to that full-time employees column. So I'm going to open up that data. Okay, here we go. So it looks like back in the middle of June, that full-time employees column actually existed in the data. And the pipeline was uh, running successfully at that point. At some point there, it was dropped out of the data set from our source provider, and it started leading to those, those key errors that we saw um, and our top errors that we drilled into before. So at, at this point, what I know is the reason why this issue happened. It's because the data set changed. What I can also do in our application is track what this means in terms of like downstream effects of this. So I can check really quickly to see if any other pipelines are reading from this data location, right? So if, if this data is now changed, like is this affecting other pipelines as well? Uh, now doing just a quick sanity check there, searching for the reads on this location, I can see it's only that first pipeline, market data ingestion, where we came from. And uh, it looks like at least recently, no other pipelines are reading from this. So it looks like just as a sanity check, we're OK. So this is helping me now understand the cause of the issue. So I can go in and I can triage quickly. I, I know my uh, reliability metrics and, and how those are being impacted by this problem and the effect of this, if it's having an effect on any downstream processes. Um, what I can, uh, but what I'll point out is there's a lot easier, a lot quicker of a way that we can just call out this issue right from the get-go and provide this information without going through so much deep dive into um, what's moving between this data set. So if I actually travel just back to my uh, main dashboard here and I scroll down to my metrics, I'll be able to see right in front of me immediately what contributed to this change that uh, has been leading to these, these errors in the process. So DataBand here is just monitoring some metrics that are undergoing a lot of change in the system. Uh, the first one is a performance metric, uh, the duration of the pipeline, and we can see how that's fluctuating over time. If there's any anomalies here, DataBand will point that out and alert users on those anomalous durations, on those, on those metrics. Again, that's really important because that's a good leading indicator of problems that might later come up in a pipeline. And you want to catch those early, especially a long running process. Uh, the other metric, really importantly, this is just my column count from the, the data set that we were just diving into. So right off the bat, DataBand can help me understand by monitoring that, that metadata, that column structure, that schema, where the change came from. And we can see, in early June here, like we saw in our, our data set view, the column count, I'll zoom in a bit, the column count for this process was 60, as we saw when we dived through the data. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of, the, of June, it jumped down to 59. So here is actually precisely where our uh, data provider, where we're getting that data, where they made the change and the column was dropped out. And I can actually click into that process and jump into the exact run when that key error first appeared, which is where I am now. Right. So um, this is a real error that came up in our, our demo process. The next step for us in DataBand, just making sure that we have a healthy process here, we actually reached out to our um, data provider and, uh, and uh, had them make the change. Okay. Um, I'll pause here, and let's flip into um, uh, questions if, if they're in the uh, if any have come up in the group um, before I get there if you'd like to see more in the application please feel free to contact us and uh, feel free to schedule a demo we're actually running a special trial anyone coming from the airflow summit has 45 days free um, so uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, if there's any uh, any interest in seeing more okay.